If you're an animal lover, you're going to love this show. We're going to get it from the animal's perspective out here at the Garden Home Retreat. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. And in this case, a show about pets. We're going to be talking about many of the animals that call this old farm site home. You know, ever since I was a kid, I've loved animals. I guess it comes from having been raised on a farm. And you know, I've collected quite a few animals since we got started out here. And just yesterday, the stork brought these two little babies. Aren't they adorable? I have to say, Lucky and Angel were the first to be out here. But we've come a long way since then, and I've noticed that we're starting to attract lots of creatures who feel right at home. Obviously, in the vegetable garden, there's a host of butterflies, bees, birds, and maybe even a few other beneficial insects buzzing around. And I've seen some of these fantastic chartreuse green tree frogs hanging around. They especially like the humid greenhouse as a hiding place, although sometimes we coax them out for the camera. As you move into the fields away from the cultivated areas, there are even more birds, such as bluebirds and martins, as well as deer and turkeys. You know, we've actually gotten some of the turkeys out here on the farm on camera, and that's a pretty impressive feat given how shy they are. Now, a little later, I'm going to introduce you to the newest addition to my little menagerie, and that's the swans. And I'm even going to share with you a blooper moment involving swans that you're not going to believe. It's so funny, I can't believe I'm showing it to you on national television. On weekends, I like to come out here when I've got some spare time and just commune with nature. Not only the animals that are out here, but much of the wildlife that you find on this farm. Okay, now I'm going to put these little guys back in there with their mommies and everybody will be happy. Come on, girls. Here we go. There we go. Here are your babies back. There are your babies. There we go. There we go. Oh, yeah. A happy reunion. This is one of my favorite areas out here at the Garden Home Retreat and it's just about to get the newest addition to the animal kingdom out here. You know, in the summer, it's so beautiful because all of these agapanthus that are in pots around this pool bloom those gorgeous blue flowers. Now, what I have here is a 14-foot diameter pool, and throughout the summer, I bet we produced a scrillion tadpoles in the way of baby toads and frogs, and now I'm going to add some goldfish. And what I have are three bags of goldfish that I got from a friend who has a fish farm in a neighboring county. You see, they ship them in these bags of water with extra oxygen in them. And believe it or not, they can ship goldfish for up to 24 hours. So what I'm doing here is I'm floating the bags for a little while in the water so that the water in the bag and the water in the pool become the same. And I think they're just about there. So now it's time to release these guys. They're just gorgeous. Here we go. Woo, they're having a good time. Look at them loving their new home. All right, now I've got another bag here. This one has a great big goldfish in it. But before I open that one, I'm going to go over here and get this, this one that's been soaking for a while. You can see they've already found their way to the bottom of the pool. The pool is only four feet deep. And they have them double bagged so that in case the outer bag punctures, you don't have water going everywhere. And here's one more. Just look down in there. They're so gorgeous. All right, here we go. There's some big ones, medium and small. Looks like there's about 20 to 25 goldfish per bag. So it looks like we're going to have about 75 fish in here. 
Okay, here's the last one. I think they're probably sufficiently acclimated. Let me get this one open now. The last one is like Christmas, opening up packages. Here's the second bag. Wow, look at these. They are just gorgeous. I just have to show you one. Woohoo! Look at the size of that one. Woo! <laughs> they are so amazing. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at the sheen on that fish. It's just beautiful. Let's, we're, I'm just going to let it go. There you go into your new home. All right. All sizes here as well. Okay, here we go. Twenty-one, three, twenty-four, five, six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, nine, thirty, and one more little white one. <laughs> Look at that one, silvery white. These are so beautiful, and they're going to add such a dynamic quality to the pool. They're one of the most beautiful members of the animal kingdom. There's plenty of activity going on out here with the construction of the house, but the garden, I have to say, is beginning to slide off into its winter slumber. You can see we've had a frost and it's knocked these marigolds down, but even with the cooler temperatures, I've discovered there's lots of insect activity going on, particularly on warm days like this. You know, ever since colonial times in this country, we have recognized the difference between bad bugs and good bugs, or beneficials as they're called. In fact, many of our ancestors had insectaries where they produced or nurtured the culture of beneficial insects. Well, what's interesting is you can certainly do that on a garden of this scale or smaller, but commercial growers, growers who are growing lots of food organically, have turned to beneficial insects to help them. In fact, a few years ago in the fall, I caught up with my old friend and farmer, Mark Moreno, who talked about how to lure in and attract some of those beneficial insects. Well, we usually like to put about 5% of our land on these ranches with this beneficial insect mix, and we do it on the edges because it takes a different kind of care. It also is here a lot longer than some of our crops. We have lacewing larvae, ladybugs, trichogamma wasp, praying mantis. Another type of beneficial insect, which is not a predator, but it does a lot of pollinating of our crops, is the uh, honeybees. Some of the plants that we have in here are the bachelor buttons in the blue and the pink, baby's breath here. We have some different legumes and California poppies. On a home garden, it's really a nice thing to do because it gives an area for the population of the beneficial insects to increase. Plus, it's so beautiful, too, that it's actually like having a little flower garden next to your vegetable garden. Well, I truly enjoy watching the leaves change color this time of year, and I'm anxiously anticipating the first winter snow so I can test out all those fireplaces that we're putting in the garden home retreat. I'm going to miss the vibrant color of all the butterflies in the garden. Have you ever wondered where the butterflies go during the winter? Butterfly, flutter by, flutter by. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Butterfly, <laughs> flutter by. <laughs> Sometimes it works. In addition to educating children about the life cycle of butterflies, Rova Caro of Pacific Grove, California, has fought the good fight to preserve an important part of the monarch butterfly's habitat. Can I really fly? Last time I remember, I was a little caterpillar. I'm going to have to check these out and do a test flight and see if I can fly. And it tests them out and it says, I can, I can. 
I'm not a caterpillar anymore. Now I'm a butterfly. I'm going to go fly, find a purple flower and drink the nectar because I can fly. Okay, so that's how a brand new butterfly is born. Thank you. You're welcome. They particularly like eucalyptus trees, and in California, that's what most of the habitats are made of. What happened is in November of 1990, we suddenly realized that the property owner who owned these trees at the time had a subdivision approval to cut down all of the butterfly trees and build condominiums in here, and we couldn't let that happen. Friends of the Monarch spearheaded a campaign to put a ballot argument uh, in front of the people for a tax measure to buy the property for the city and turned it into a city park. And we were so proud of the people of Pacific Grove. 69% of them said, yes, go ahead. Wonderful. Tax me. We've got to save the butterflies. We take butterflies very seriously here. This is Butterfly Town USA. And we've had a city ordinance on our books since 1938 that there's a $1,000 fine for molesting a butterfly in any way. Monarch butterflies, any kind of butterfly, is a, a symbol of hope, renewal, rebirth, resurrection. And uh, like rainbows, it, it's one of those hopeful symbols that uh, just the thought of them makes you smile. The sight of them makes you glow. We can't do without them. No. I've had some wonderful questions from little kids. Probably my favorite, favorite question came from a little, little boy about six years old. I'd answered everything I could answer for everybody. And I said, any other questions? And he said, what are they thinking up there? <laughs> well, as you can see, it's a beehive of activity out here. They're moving ahead on the roof of the house, and you can see half of the house on this end has received its lime wash. Looking good there, Chris, that's great. Now, what we're doing here is we're trying to get a holly hedge in, this idea of creating garden rooms. So on this east end of the garden home retreat, we'll have one big enclosed area by this needle point holly hedge. Now, when we plant them, what we're doing is we're mixing half the soil that came out of the trench and a mixture of good organic potting soil that has mycorrhizae in it. You see, this will encourage the roots to grow. They'll grow all winter long, and as soon as spring comes, these plants will flush with growth. Now, sometime during the winter, we're gonna shape these holly hedges up so that those dormant buds on the stems of the hollies will begin to swell in anticipation of the spring. Now, with this style of architecture, we wanted to make sure that there's symmetry. If you look at the house from the front, it is perfectly symmetrical. So this hedge is coming off both sides of the house. And if you look at it from a bird's eye view, you can see how we laid it out by using some spray paint, just as surveyors do. And we outlined the edge of the trench. They dug out the trench, and now they're coming back in with this blend of humus, mycorrhizae, and the existing soil. So I can't wait till spring and see this thing flush. It's going to be gorgeous. Well, James, it looks like you've got the, the ribbon in place already. Yeah, we just finished putting it in. Oh, you did that in short order. You know, what we found out here is that we've been getting some little visitors, uh -huh. just, just a few deer. But my fear is that since we're surrounded by all this woodland, and as you know, natural habitat is eroding and yes. uh, there are fewer and fewer predators, uh, that what we're going to end up with, word's going to get out, and they're all going to come around, and they're going to feed an Allen's delicatessen. Well, you set a table for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we exactly. have, haven't we? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot easier to keep the stuff protected than it is to get it back once you've suffered damage. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's a little hard for me to imagine that this ribbon is going to be a major deterrent to deer, <laughs> given what I know about the whitetail. <laughs> yes, yeah. The important part is it's not the ribbon that's doing the work. The ribbon is more of the wick. It's the repellent that's really going to be doing the work to keep the deer so, at bay. So how, how often do you do you apply the repellent to, to the wick, as you refer to sure. it? Sure. Uh, whether it's the, the ribbon or the plant, it's every 30 days. Well, what, what are some of the plants that, that you would use to say to a deer, look, there's really not anything in here you want? I mean, I know some of the standard, they don't like narcissus, right. uh, daffodils of any kind, and they, and they don't like lavender. The important part is to say they don't like. It doesn't mean they won't eat. Yeah, well, that's true. There's nothing a deer won't eat. It's what they'll eat last. So it comes down to available food. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And the more deer there are, 
less food there is available. Unfortunately, instead of having seasonal times to protect against deer, the season is getting longer and longer. I mean, yeah. traditionally, it, it's almost... It was the winter, wasn't it? it? Well, it was, you know, when when the deer would kind of start, their natural food source would die down. They needed something to eat. Yeah, and it is for your evergreens, your white pines and your rhododendrons, for example. And in the springtime, you're going to do more annual protection, um, where you might be able to leave the evergreens alone. It's just so much easier to protect what you have than get it back. Do deer communicate with one another to let them know, hey, we found a great food source, come over, or are they fairly selfish about that. I imagine they do, but they don't talk to me. So whatever they're saying, I don't know. Well, if you said they were talking to you, I'd be a little worried, James. <laughs> <That's my life. laughs> Come on, Kit. Well, Kit is one of the Belgian draft horses that I received quite by surprise. My sister gave them to me as a birthday present. What a shock. And I think she was actually getting back at me because two years before that, for Easter, I had a box of 25 ducklings sent to my niece and nephews. It's a pair of Belgian draft horses. Kit is the mom and the son is Atticus. You see, they had outgrown the home where they were before and they needed a home. And my sister thought, well, this is the perfect place for them. Well, I had some other friends who were moving and had a pair of peacocks and decided that this would be a great home for them. So we have now Castor and Pollux. Now, just a slight digression. If you remember your Greek and Roman mythology, Castor and Pollux, well, they were the sons of Leda and Zeus. Leda as of the Leda and the Swan, Leda. And since these two boys are so fanciful, we figured giving them names like that from royal parents made a lot of sense. They originally come from India and they do very well here. They can take the cold temperatures and they love to roost in the trees. So we'll see how well they get along with the garden. Recently, I've discovered that Castor and Pollux have developed an appetite for my broccoli. I consider these peafowl to be walking gardens with the beautiful colors that you find in the iridescent feathers. They do indeed look like a walking flower. This is a big day for the waterfowl here at the Garden Home Retreat. What we have are swans, geese, and ducks. A few weeks ago, I was with friends who raised swans and they said, hey, when are you gonna start having some swans out at your place? I said, I don't know, I'd love to have some. And then they said, well, what about today? We have five. <laughs> so here we are, I'm in the swan business. Now they told me that I needed to have some little friends for them. So I picked up a couple of geese and three ducks and they're getting along beautifully. Now this is really exciting for them because they've been here a week and this is their first day to come down here onto one of the ponds. So I'm just herding them along. See, they're very gentle. Okay, they're seeing the water. They're seeing the water. Here we go. We've all heard the adage, like a duck to water. Hopefully this will apply to the geese and swans. Come on ducks, let's go. Come on guys. This is their maiden voyage in the pond. There we go. And don't they look happy? There's nothing more beautiful than to see mute swans on a pond, and that's what we want to do here. It's just going to add to the picturesque quality of the farm. So there they go, across the pond. How thrilling. Now all we can do is keep our fingers crossed that they're going to hang around. Now we all know swans from fairy tales, but some interesting facts about them may astonish you. For instance, mute swans are considered the largest waterfowl in the world. The males can have a wingspan over eight feet. Now these are juvenile birds. They were just hatched in March, but just look at the size of them. Now, as you can see, they're already up on the shore preening. I think they're gonna be very happy here. Now they call them mute swans because they really don't make a lot of noise, except during the mating season and when they're on the nest, which reminds me of a swan story that started in a historic garden in Charleston. Now, this is what I would call a blooper, and it all started when I was trying to interview Sidney Frazier about Middleton Place's amazing azaleas. And what happens is we apparently get too close to a swan's nest. Now, as you can see, we weren't acting in any threatening way. 
But all of a sudden, this male swan felt like he needed to defend his turf, so he hightails it across the water after me, not Sydney, but me. On shore, this swan was literally biting my back pocket. Thankfully, I had my wallet in it, the darn pickpocket, but I swear the wallet saved my hide. He had really gone after me if Sydney hadn't moved further down the bank. Is there something following me? Garden designers always enjoy a challenge, and Rand Retzloff has been working on this lush woodland garden that is certainly a habitat for different wildlife. During the 2007 International Master Gardeners Conference, Rand got to share his garden with guests from around the country and the world. Several of the people that came through the, the tour were wondering what kind of fern that was, and it's that spreading you. And it seems like Arkansas is just bad for the uh, the southern yew and the northern yew. The Podocarpus doesn't do well in our winters and the Taxus yew doesn't do well in our summers. But uh, we've, we've managed to get the Taxus yew to, uh, to come on and do real well for us. It seemed like uh, they were really pleased at all the gardens that they saw. And there are several really nice gardens in Little Rock. And I was just honored to be part of that. That was, that was nice. Just a, a great program, good for gaining and, and distributing knowledge, and they're always working to add to the curriculum and, and change the curriculum to meet current times. Uh, so it's the Master Gardener program is a work in progress, a great educational tool, and the more we can educate the public, the more they can have fun gardening. This is a great bird haven, and you have a nice range of, of different types of birds. It, we were doing really well until a hawk built a nets up in the northeast corner of the property. Uh, and now, you know, if he is out, there is no small bird wildlife. They're, they're scattered and gone. We do have a problem with herons coming to get the koi. We have to put out decoys on the herons to keep them away because they're so territorial but you have to take them out during mating season so we don't attract them to this spot. But uh, the river is close and there are a lot of herons. The sides are deep enough to where we don't have any problem with raccoons. And we've had one spawning and I think we had one this year from the activity of the fish. Well, I've yet to see any babies coming out. But they'll, uh, they'll go over the falls and they'll be stuck in little pockets of, in the river here and then they'll eventually make their way down. And they are really tough to catch when we had to redo the, uh, the pond. Even in a little bit of water, they were really tough because you, you really don't want to disturb and rip up all the fins. That's the big show too. Uh, our accent pieces are a uh, crustaceous limestone, very heavily pitted, covered in lichen and moss, and our our creek rock is, is just that, it's, it's creek rock. And we do like they do in nature where the big pieces get pushed to the side and you have the gravel and the smaller pieces in the center and just replicate what uh, nature has done. Fill in the bottom and cover it in gravel and, and let her go. As soon as I finish my lines, it's your turn. Got it, Atticus? Got it, Moose? Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's show as much as I have. We've had a great time out here with all the animals. You know, it's so much fun to spend time out on this beautiful place and not only enjoy the domestic animals, but so much of the wildlife. I look forward to seeing you next time. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. Good boy, good boy. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. There's a lot going on out here at the Garden Home Retreat, and this is going to be the creative center of the entire place. We'll start moving into this outdoor studio where I'm looking forward to setting up my easel and painting this winter. 
But first, I'll reminisce about painting al fresco and give you some ideas for looking at your garden with an artistic eye. Hope to see you next time right here at the Garden Home.